Good afternoon. I'm Jim Check with Kelowna Now, and we're going live with Jason and Neil from Fortis. Uh, we have Jason Wolf and uh, Neil Proban. Uh, maybe uh, you start with you, Jason, and tell us the area that you work in with Fortis. Sure. I'm the director of energy solutions, which is a fancy word for my job is to attract and retain customers. So I work with our electric and gas customers, everything from residential to uh, commercial and industrial. Is that is that a BC region that you look after, or, is it, or what is your? Yeah, you bet. Just BC. Okay. So all of BC, uh, Vancouver Island, Lower Mainland, up north, uh, Interior, Kootenays, the, the whole area. Awesome. And then Neil? Yeah, my name is Neil Pauber, and I'm the Senior Manager of Community and Indigenous Relations. So what basically that means is I work with a lot of the locally elected officials in our communities, that being municipalities and Indigenous governance. And I also work pretty much the interior, so north all the way to Port Nelson and all the way down to the U.S. border. Awesome. So the reason that we uh, reached out to Fortis was that recent news story that we did that you guys asked for a pipeline extension and then the BC Utilities Commission denied that pipeline project. And then you had some warnings and maybe um, who's better to answer that question? I'll probably take that one. You know, that was a project. uh, So that's the Okanagan Capacity Upgrade Project that we filed with the BC Utilities Commission, who's our regulator. And we filed that because we were seeing that we were looking at capacity constraints in the upcoming uh, few years here because of the growth in the Okanagan Valley. As you look around, as you all know, um, the Okanagan Valley is growing very quickly. We're getting more gas customers. Um, we're getting more gas and uh, people who want more gas. So we were starting to see this trend unfold. And so we uh, filed an uh, application for a 30 kilometer pipeline and uh, thought that that was the best solution for providing the capacity shortfall that we first saw coming but unfortunately that project was declined uh, just before christmas actually i think it was friday december the 22nd and so we're next steps on that is actually where they um ordered us to put forward a mitigation plan which means we're going to file kind of what we think we could do to deal with the capacity constraint and that's going to be filed at the middle of the year at the end of july and the interesting thing is while the commission didn't really agree with the project, they did agree that there is going to be a capacity shortfall. So at least we're both thinking in the same way there that they do recognize that. We just have to look at it a different way um, and include a bit more kind of thought around things like facility improvements, possibly compressed natural gas injection. That's some of the things that we'll probably be looking at when we file this update in July. So instead of the update, can you file an appeal as well? Or is it just the update that you're kind of working on? We do have options to do that, but I think um, what we're going to look at is probably more of the plan because we really want to put forward a solution for our customers. You know, we we heard the commission on this um, project, but we, the good part is, you know, we're both in the same agreement that there is a capacity shortfall. So that now is just a now we're just going to be talking about what does that solution look like? And so that's why we're going to focus on the plan for the mid-year. Yeah, because we've seen some political reaction. We've seen Renee Merrifield, the MP for, for Kelowna here, react to it. And then we've also seen, I think David Eby made an announcement uh, a couple of days ago as well. And I think a lot of that announcement has increased um, energy. And a lot of it had to do with hydrogen, I think. Is that is that where they're thinking some of this is going to meet some of that shortfall? Yeah, and Jason will touch on this in a bit here, but in, we are seeing, you know, because Fortis has both gas and electricity in the uh, Okanagan re- region, we are going to see that there's going to be increased uh, electricity needs. And that's what the province just announced uh, through BC Hydro, the uh, $36 billion capital plan. So they're seeing, too, that there's an increased demand on electricity. So we see it, you know, we're pretty fortunate that we have both systems. So we um, have a lot of data and we can see how things are happening. So we see um, really to get to the capacity shortfalls, you need a gas system, you need an electric system, and they both have to work in tangent together uh, to really meet the needs of customers. In the last week here, we've seen with this really cold weather, I don't know if you're watching the news, but uh, Hydro announced that they had up to 11,000 megawatts of power being consumed. And we did our uh, figures and we actually produced 22,000 megawatts equivalent. So our system- even lent some to Alberta and to the Pacific Northwest. Mm. So our, uh, so our gas system is carrying, you know, I call it the heavy lifter. It does twice yeah. the amount of electricity in these cold uh, weather days. So, and that's what we were saying with our uh, Okanagan capacity project was that we need to provide capacity for these customers during the coldest days of the year. And that was what we thought would be the best solution forward. 
Yeah. So, I mean, one of the points there, you're saying, like, what role does gas play in this? Like, you guys do hydro and, and different things. Like, what is like what is kind of the mix that goes on right now with Fortis, and how do you see that mix going forward? Maybe I'll take this one, and just in a provincial context, like, where sure. does all our energy come from? We yeah. have majority of our energy actually comes from liquid fuels, gasoline, diesel, and then natural gas, as well as some wood waste in industrial, and then uh, electricity. And so the gas system through Fortis BC delivers about 17% of the energy, BC Hydro delivers about 14%, uh, and Fortis BC Electric about 1%. But what you see in that whole mix is that you need all these components to deliver all the energy we need in the province. You're going to need a bit of everything. Uh, but when we go further and talk about decarbonization, how do we do that? Our electric system is very clean, um, but we're also in a position where we're importing a lot of power now that is as clean. Our gas system is clean from a fossil fuel perspective, but there are also things we can do there, such as renewable gas, uh, such as hydrogen, to reduce the emissions. Because as Neil said, we're, we're going to need both these systems, not just year round to deliver the energy, but especially in the cold times, you're going to need both systems. So it's more a matter of how do we reduce the emissions on the gas system? And then on the electric side of the, of the equation, how do we get more electricity and more ability to deliver that electricity? Because we'll need that as well. Yeah, because in, if we talk about electric, there's a big push for EVs too. I think they're, they're, the government is trying to push for, I think it's 2035 for all new sales to be mm -hmm. EVs. And obviously, I mean, I drive an EV and uh, I know that they take, you know, a pretty good chunk of power. I mean, they're running off a 220 plug at home, right? So they're basically like running your dryer all night. Um, so they do take quite a bit of energy. What What is like the capacity right now for Fortis? I, obviously, that's not going to ramp up overnight. That's going to take mm -hmm. time for this switchover to play. But say it takes, you know, seven, eight, nine years for, you know, like that EV kind of like adoption. Is Fortis ready to do that? or? Well, certainly you're right. We In the electric side of the business and in BC Hydro, uh, the demand was rather flat over the number of years, but it's ramping up because of uh, – policy from a standpoint of uh, building and commercial electrification, as well as electric vehicles. And both are starting to raise the demand for electricity. And so uh, on our, our electric side of our business, we're looking at that. We have some capacity available, um, but like all other electric systems in North America, there's only so much and we're starting to ramp up pretty quickly. So we're gonna have to take a close look at how we can help meet that need uh, for electric vehicles, because certainly we want to have that ability for our customers but at the same time, that might mean, are there other areas in which perhaps energy can be used that doesn't consume electricity in the same way so that we can help manage that load? Is that, One of those. Is that hydrogen? Is... Well, no, thinking things like uh, energy efficiency on the electric side. If oh, you can okay. be more energy efficient, you have more room left over for things like cars. If we're looking at building electrification, uh, you might want to electrify or have a heat pump, but you might need a backup system or heating for those cold times so that you can still have the system work on the electric side, but not have it, you know, cripple when that cold temperature comes and you can still have enough room for doing cars. So it's that mix that you have to look at. So there's one thing to produce power and then the other was the transmission. If you could produce unlimited power, is, is our transmission line strong enough to transmit the power that's going to be required? Not yet, no. Um, I think across, this is both a Fortis BC and a BC Hydro uh, issue, which is why the Premier announced that $36 billion. That is primarily for uh, transmission lines and, and bigger substations. And it, we have the luxury, as Neil said, uh, of having electricity and gas in Kelowna. And we actually did a study. What would happen if we converted all the gas load onto the electric system? And what would that mean? And we assumed that we would have endless power generation that would just come from somewhere. Right. Yeah. Um, when we did that, though, the increases in infrastructure were significant. We would need two more uh, transmission lines. We would have to nearly triple the number of substations in uh, Kelowna. And so these are big considerations, which is why we want to look for, OK, are there other options? How do we how, how can we manage this in a, in a different way? Because building transmission lines uh, and substations takes a long time, and so does generation. And, you know, so we have to be careful about ramping up too quickly on the electric load such that we can't actually meet it. So, so maybe just for the, for the average viewer, including myself, explain how, like, the power that's generated, say, at a dam 
And then how does it get to the home? Like it goes through, like just maybe just kind of give us a kind of like a, a brief on that. Cole's notes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm probably a good person to do it because I know less than Neil on this. Uh, maybe I'll start and he'll correct me. Uh, so you've got a dam or a generation facility. Depends on the jurisdiction. We have a lot of dams. Alberta has thermal generation mostly with gas. You have that. It goes through transmission lines, usually gets to the edge of a city, and it goes through a transfer, a stepping down, a big substation essentially. And then you get to distribution lines and transformers that you see on poles through your city blocks and then the, the smaller lines that go to your house. So those are all throttling things, though, right? Because you're sending mass That's mass right. to a substation. Substation kind of then takes it and kind of brings it down and distributes yeah. it in finer lines. And the, kind of like the tree roots kind of thing, right? You have the big trunk yeah. and then the tree roots, the fingers as they go out smaller until you get to the house, which is like a 220 feet or something like that, right? Yeah. So when you, uh, yeah, your houses are usually a hundred amp. Now we're seeing 200 amp houses and with electric cars, electric heating, sometimes we're now seeing 400 amp. And so when you, you have to have enough capacity is what we call it, but really think of a pipe. It has to be big enough to fit all those electrons through, be able to carry enough all the way from the dam through the transmission line substation to all these smaller wires right to the home and the whole way along that there has to be enough room to move those electrons. And if you have not enough room, that's when you start to get things like brownouts like you might have seen in California, where the demand is too great. And so you still get some electricity, but you don't get all that you need. So you, say your hair dryer that is 100, uh, 100 watt, it might be running a little cold. That's kind of what a brownout is. And, mm. and we don't want that, certainly. We want to make sure that all those components have enough room. But that's why EB, uh, Premier EB announced this uh, infrastructure, because there needs to be more room in all those you know, sections to get those electrons to the customer. So our grids are tied, obviously, to the Pacific Northwest and to Alberta. And you're saying we buy some power still, and then obviously we sell some power when we can too? Or? Yeah, and, and that's both the gas system and the electric system. That's how the whole North American system works. We have to be able to buy and sell energy, and we help out other regions and back and forth so it's stable across North America. And, and, and this is how it's worked for 50 years. Uh, for Fortis BC, we have our own dams, but we also buy power from BC Hydro. We have agreements and we buy power from the U.S. BC Hydro uh, has direct lines as well to the U.S. and to Alberta. And last year, BC Hydro bought about 20% of their power from primarily the U.S., but also a bit from Alberta. Okay. So if, like, you, you guys did that scenario, um, if we went all electric on everything and every car was EV... I'm assuming that the shortfalls is is more in the transmission lines and the and the substations at this point. And what's a substation worth, and how long does it take to put one up? Um, I could probably take a few of these. Uh, so it's a, yeah, go ahead. Point. Um, you want all three of those components working in tangent. Sorry. So that's the key. Like you have to have enough generation, enough transmission, enough distribution. You want to have, it's like a chain and it all has to work together. So if you do go to that scenario, even anywhere you have one of those problems, it, it's a problem along the entire system, right? So um, one thing too that um, is pretty interesting too that's happened is that during the pandemic, everyone was talking about supply chains and they were a problem. And we all expected that the supply, supply chains would return once the pandemic was over, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, you're seeing a little slowdown and a lot of things, things that Parts uh, like transformers that we order and require are taking double of the time. So you you do see a little bit of this kind of pressures put on the electric system like that. So that's why like when we're Jason and I are talking, like that's why it's important to have these two systems working together because you know the diversity, we call it the diversified pathway, where we're having both a gas system and electric system, because you kind of want to have that diversity so that you have both systems working together to give customers the most most choice and also the most reliability when you have both running at the same time. And then right now, is not gas, natural gas for home heating, kind of the least expensive option for most people other than electricity? And that's quite a big difference, though, too, isn't it? Like number-wise, like 75%? I'm, I'm just, I, yeah. I think I read that somewhere. I, I'll, I'll put it all into cents per kilowatt hour because sometimes it's easier to compare that way. So natural gas, including your carbon tax for a residential customer, is about 4.5 cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, on, I think BC Hydro, if I'm not mistaken, is nine and a half cents uh, for tier one and 14 cents for tier two. And in our service area, we only have one level. I can't remember, Neil, 
what our uh, rate is, uh, somewhere around 13 cents, I believe. Yeah, yeah, so quite a bit more than... some, yeah, we had some changes too. So yeah, it's pretty close yeah. to that. Is electric heat as efficient as natural gas? Either? Like, I, I know I've, I have some friends that have just electric heat in their homes and it tends to be rather <laughs> expensive for them in the, in the really cold days. Well, I think uh, there, there's a difference between efficiency and cost. And you can see, we, we talked there about the difference in price. Electric heating is actually very efficient. So baseboard heating is essentially 100% efficient. Natural gas furnaces are very close. They're 96, 97. So really not much difference. Um, so if you're comparing, uh, say, a baseboard to a furnace, um, they're nearly the same as far as efficiency goes. But then the natural gas is about a third of the price. Um, but if you go to a heat pump, you're certainly getting more efficiency there, usually up to around uh, twice the efficiency or 200%. Uh -huh. hmm. But yeah, again, if with... you compare the cost, then, you know, then it's a difference of efficiency versus cost. And, and that depends on, on right. how it works in each, each person's home. So if you're having a heat pump, you can actually have forced air too, which you're, you're blowing air as opposed to like baseboard heating, which is more radiant heating, right? Which tends to be hotter yeah. around the radiators than in the rest of the home, right? So... Yeah, that's right. Usually uh, centralized uh, heat pumps would do through forced air. That's the most common way to do it. Or you see those things that are called mini splits. But if you think of a hotel room and that uh, the, you always have a heating system there that you can turn on individually. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of similar to that as so to I, individual heat pumps. So in the Kelowna area, I had a heat pump and then I think I had it, I think it was probably like six or seven years old. And it failed, and the and the guy recommended that I put uh, an air conditioner back in as opposed to the heat pump because every year when it tried to start up in the summer, it would it would kind of like jam or whatever, and then he had to boost it a couple times, and then the last year this year it just wouldn't fire up, and he said, yeah, he said this climate's not conducive to a heat pump, so I don't know if that's accurate or not, or he's just trying to sell me an air conditioner. But uh. <laughs> hard to say heat pumps were great. Um, I mean, heat pumps really just are an air conditioner and then they're reversed in winter to provide heat, uh, okay. which is the same thing that's on the back of your refrigerator. That's a heat pump as well. Oh, okay. um, the difference with a heat pump when people talk about that is it's used a lot more than an air conditioner. An air conditioner is just used for the couple months in the summer, right. but a heat pump is used for that and the winter time. And therefore, um, you might see failing a little sooner, um, depending on you know how often it's used. Mine never really came on in the winter, though. I mean, I have a natural gas furnace tied with right. a heat pump, so the natural gas furnace seems to override the, one the heat heating. pump all the time, right? It, it did all the heating, so that's what he said. So mine didn't run in the winter at right. all. So um, yeah. And that's how a lot of people use them is is as air conditioner primarily, maybe in the right. shoulder seasons, and then keeping the uh, the furnace. Something called a hybrid, that's sort of like a hybrid system where you can actually install those now where they're kind of joined up. You have a natural gas heating source for the, the coldest times, a couple months, and then it switches over to your heat pump for the rest of the year. And that's a good way to do both, to keep the load off that electric system in the middle of the winter. Right. So I put solar on my roof this year, and it, it's supposedly supposed to generate 95% of my energy needs until I added an electric car. And then a second electric car, so I probably <laughs> <laughs> not generating the, the amount of electricity. Enough, yeah, need. yeah. How does how does Fortis view those? And I think it's great in BC that you allow reverse um, uh, metering. How does Fortis view like the solar panel systems that people are putting on their homes and that? Um, well, Neil may jump in on this because he might be a little closer to that. Certainly, you know, it's a good option for homeowners. Um, if they put solar in and in certain areas, like obviously the Okanagan, there's a lot of sun and that can that can help. Um, it is a little more expensive, though, power wise, because obviously you get credited the same uh, as what you're paying. And and so it's a good way to have a small amounts of power on. Um, but for the larger needs of power needs, you do need more a little more centralized. Right, for sure. Um, I was just saying, does that help sure. if people were to do solar like to the energy needs of Fortis? Like I say, if we had a pretty good adoption rate, would that help in our overall needs? And or is that just so small it really wouldn't factor in? Well, it's uh, the, the challenge with solar is that it, it's intermittent. And this is whether it's like on a home or in large scale, mm -hmm. it's intermittent. And obviously it works when the sun works right. um, in the shining versus when you need it on the system. So in this past couple of days, obviously solar wouldn't yeah. have done anything because 
it was too cold and not enough sun. Well, most people come home at nighttime, right? And they turn. That's everything. right. Yeah. That's why you need, you know, solar can play a role, even whether it's in like mass, mass generation or centralized generation or at home, it can play a role. What it does really is help the utility manage the use of the dams. And so you don't have to run your dams as much because you have the solar coming on. And so, so that's do, helpful. So, so do the dams and that kind of like work off of the load that's being drawn and they kind of ramp up and down based on what that load is? I guess that would be kind of a thing that they would measure the draw, I guess, and then just kind of turn stuff on. Yep. We uh, have a lot of very, very uh, dedicated people in a system control center that actually do exactly what you're saying. So we know generally, like you said, a lot of the peak electricity use is around that 5 p.m. So they're getting ready. Um, getting the generation online, trying to figure out what the needs are going to be. And so, yeah, there's a lot of people in the background that do that. Same for the gas system. We had a gas control uh, center and they were running very busy, obviously, the last week, trying to make sure that we had enough gas, enough electricity in the system to make sure that it met those peak needs. So absolutely, there's a, a lot of work that it's funny with utility comes. There's a lot of work that goes on that a lot of people don't see. And, well, it's, a, uh, it's a great thing. And then when you don't hear anything, you know, you're doing a great job, right? It's when, yeah, exactly, it's when something right? fails, well, exactly. like, you know, you're the bad guys, right? But I mean, we provide a lot of, uh, well, basically energies in everything we do every day. What is the mix, though, going forward for Fortis? Like we hear of a lot of new technology. Uh, Evie is talking about hydrogen. Is is solar part of Fortis's mix? Is wind generation or nuclear or any of those part of the mix or will they become part of the mix? Yeah, so um, Fortis is, so if you, we're actually kind of talking about interesting, we're kind of talking about the whole decarbonization of like energy and we see that being a mix, like we talked about that earlier on, Jason, myself, we see like they're needing more than just gas and electric. You're going to have to look at a whole bunch of things. So, you know, we uh, we have had this net metering program in place for, I think, over a decade now, actually. So we were looking at solar quite early. Uh, we're open to looking at projects for solar as, and wind as well. But, you know, there's a lot of economics that have to meet there, too. So it's, it's interesting that we're like we're. Um, because the need for power is going to be coming in the future. So obviously you got to keep your mind open to a lot of these options. Uh, you mentioned hydrogen and we just had two announcements. I was telling you I was up in Prince George for the Northern Resources Forum and uh, we're working with Enbridge on a blending program to they the supply of natural gas through um, the West Coast system. That's through basically the center of BC and we take our gas off them. And so we're working together with Enbridge on hydrogen blending. We also worked, uh, and this is in Jason's uh, portfolio, so he can jump in, but we worked with a, a mill up in, around Prince George with uh, Taralta, who's the company in Canfor, who's going to be the uh, consumer of it, of hydrogen as well. So we're in this space quite a bit because the decarbonization of the gas system is very important to us. And that's why we're looking at hydrogen. We haven't even really talked about renewable natural gas, which Jason spends a lot of his time doing and making sure that we're decarbonizing. And, um, getting renewable natural gas from places like... Can you explain uh, that to, 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 the, to the layman to <laughs> renewable natural gas? What, what is renewable? <laughs> what is it? That's a, that's a great question. That's a uh, back uh, dating myself the $64,000 question. <laughs> so what is it? Uh, renewable natural gas comes from wastewater treatment plants, landfills, green curbside waste, farm agriculture waste, and all those different facilities or, or different forms of, uh, of waste produce methane when they decompose. And so a simple word is it, it's rotting on the ground. It produces methane. And if we didn't do anything, that methane would uh, leak into the atmosphere. What we do is you collect it in various facilities, you clean it up, and you put it in the pipeline. And by doing that, you displace the need for conventional gas. For every one molecule of renewable gas you take, you don't need conventional. So it, it makes it so that it's nearly carbon neutral. It's very, very low carbon. And it's using something that's renewable because we're always going to have more farm waste. We're going to have landfills. And so those things are always so going to be what's producing. That mix, what's that mix kind of like? Where are we at with that mix? And where do we see that mix? Like, is that 1%, a half percent? Or where is that at right now? We have a few percent right now. Uh, and we're bringing on a, a whole bunch more. We have enough uh, contracted right now to equal about the output of Site C dam. So about that same amount wow. of energy. Um, by 2030, we're looking at hitting about 15% of our system could be renewable gas. So then that would say like in people's homes, they could continue burning natural gas and be carbon neutral, basically. Exactly. We actually have an application that we're waiting on a decision from the BC Utilities Commission, whereby we're proposing that all new residential construction, so towers, individual homes, would all receive 100% renewable gas. 
And so that would meet all the new building code, uh, right. that building codes that are coming in. And exactly as you said, that home could still use their furnaces, their boilers, their cooktops, barbecues, yet be carbon neutral. Yeah, so, so I guess more information needs to get out about that because I think a lot of people just think natural gas bad, right, when it could be a carbon neutral fuel for, for people to use in their homes. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, we were the first utility in North America to offer this. So we've been doing it for 12 years. But, you know, there's, there's we have about 12,000 customers right now, but it is ramping up and uh, we're seeing more industrial, you know, views on perhaps they can use it in industry. How can we use it in things like hotels and, and restaurants and, and other commercial mm -hmm. premises as well to, to reduce our emissions, yet still allow, say, a restaurant to continue cooking as they normally have and their whole processes, they're all the same. So Ontario is putting an SMR, I guess a small modular reactor into play in the next little while here. I think it's, I can't remember what the date is, 2026 mm -hmm. or something like that. Is BC have any plans for to do any like SMRs or nuclear plants at all? Right now, the legislate, there is legislation that uh, prohibit nuclear energy okay. in the province. So that would have to change before there is a look at that. Yeah. Um, when Sounds we're like talking like, looking at that for sure. They certainly are, I think, because a nuclear energy or dams uh, or thermal generation are all things what we call firm. So they can be used when you need it and during that cold time. They're always ready to go. And so that I'm, I'm sure that's why Alberta is looking at it in Ontario. And it does have uh, obviously it doesn't have any emissions right now. That would be that would have to be a policy decision or a change in, in how okay. we view it in B.C. I mean, BC is lucky to have all the water stuff so we can do a lot more dams than Alberta can. But um, I imagine if they did a few and we needed power, we could we could buy or borrow power from them. Um, <laughs> um, is there anything that, that I haven't touched on that, that you'd like, you know, like viewers to know about how they get their power or what, you know, like what Fortis is doing now and into the future? I think the biggest message we have, and Neil touched on it, this concept of diversified energy forms, or put another way, we're going to need a mix of all kinds of things and not to put all our eggs in one basket. Electricity is going to play a big part in reducing emissions, um, but you're going to need other energy forms uh, that can also help reduce emissions as well, but you're going to need a multitude of different solutions and different tools in our toolbox to both deliver affordable, reliable power, but also reduce emissions. Yeah, and maybe I'll just touch back on the RNG because I don't think, um, you know, you've made a good point, Jim, that we don't probably don't talk about it enough. But when we make these changes on decarbonization, maybe quite a bit, uh, it's a quite favorable material change. Like I think the equivalent of since we've been decarbonizing is about 238,000 cars being removed from BC. Like, Wow. So when we um, start decarbonizing the gas system, you're seeing some very positive movements. And, you know, like to Jason's point, the RNG goes through the system now. People, our customers can use it. It's a great way of decarbonizing very quickly. So, and it, it does really uh, make a material change. So, you know, from that standpoint, that's why we're, we're probably right. We probably should be doing a better job of showing all the things that we're doing for British Columbians on the, in terms of environment and climate. But yeah, I think to Jason's point too, like that's why we're all about the diversified pathway and all these energy choices. And like, even for yourself, you know, you have your solar, you have gas, you have electric, you had to, you made these energy choices for yourself for what made sense for your situation, right? And that's what we're saying is like, people should have a choice for the kind of energy they need for their situation. I was lucky enough to go to the CES. Um, have you guys ever attended that that show in, in Las Vegas? Um, it Would was- love to uh, go, but no. <laughs> The big message for sure, like a thousand booths or whatever. Oh, no, sorry, 10,000 uh -huh. booths, 10,000. It's the big the big theme there, def definitely electrification of everything. I mean, everything, right? Motorcycles, cars, autonomous street sweepers, all uh, lawnmowers, everything. It was like it's an electric world at the CES. I think it was like if, if I had two themes out of that, I would say it was... Uh, like electricity and or energy and um, AI, those two things, and a lot of those things working in combination, right? And I'm sure you guys use a lot of AI. Is there anything you want to like share with AI? What what Fortis might be using and how you're? I imagine you must have some pretty slick computer modeling when you're when you're looking at energy demands. I'm probably the wrong person to be talking about that because I don't know that area very well of our business. I, and and being a utility. We have to be actually very careful with data, so we're adopt, slowly adopting AI, but it's, I would call it, you know, pragmatic and, and kind of slow. But to your point about electrification, 
you know, yes, we're going to see lots more things electrify. Like I have an electric mountain bike and I love it because I'm getting older. Um, so it's fabulous. But that also means we're going to have to find a way to generate the electricity. And that's probably the bigger challenge, which is what uh, the utilities are, you know, um, we're going to be facing as we've talked about all today. So there is a great future for a lot more use of electricity, but we're also going to need to find ways to generate it. And to do that too, we're going to need to look at both systems really, or more than both systems. We're going yeah, to I really to like that RNG forms. thing. I, I think that's, that's great news. And I think that message needs to get out more because I think there's enough messaging out there saying, you know, gas bad, natural gas bad and all that stuff. And, uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, here's a way that we have a carbon neutral gas that people can hang onto their, you know, gas furnaces and stuff like that. They've, you know, come to rely on. Um, yeah, very much. And uh, like I said, uh, with like what I said, what I saw at CES, so you guys are going to be in high demand. <laughs> There's a good headline for you: high demand for Fortis, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. There was a lot of motorcycles there too, like that. I haven't seen any electric motorcycles mm -hmm. really out here yet but they were sure selling a lot there um or selling or, or showcasing a lot of electric motorcycles right. and large display is a lot of stuff that uses a lot of electricity um mm -hmm. a lot of stuff in appliances too and i know you guys do some rebates on appliances too and i think i went through your website and i think that is another thing that people should know more about that the rebates offered by fortis there's a lot of things in fridges and washers and dryers and different things like that so I mean, how do, how do you get the word out more to the, the general population on some of that stuff? Well, certainly we have our advertising and we encourage people to go to our website. There's a lot of point of sale uh, marketing. We work with vendors and, and uh, manufacturers, et cetera, to get all that message out too. We work with the trades to get the messages out. So there, there's some pretty good messaging there, but absolutely we would encourage people go to our website and, and take a look because there's all kinds of incentives there to help people reduce, you know, reduce their energy yeah. usage and whether it's a fridges yeah. or, you know, et cetera. We try to do quite a bit and we've done led lights a few years ago. Um, mm -hmm. the only one I was going to say, we did those, uh, those twirly bulbs. Was that CFLs? That was yeah. kind of a, a, a flop, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> LEDs <laughs> came in quickly then and, and replaced that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, I, I thank you guys for your time today. That was been great. Uh, our pleasure. All right, yeah, we'd love to have you on again as well. And thank you for watching Kelowna Now. <laughs>